Good morning, Cornerstone. We come today to a very interesting and maybe somewhat puzzling or perplexing incident between God and Moses' family. And to be quite honest with you all today, for full disclosure, I would have preferred to skip over this part of the text altogether because it's so complicated. But I believe what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, that all scripture is inspired by God. Beneficial for teaching, for rebuke and correction, and for training in righteousness. And if that's true, if all scripture is useful for these purposes, then Exodus chapter 4, verse 24 and 25 cannot be excluded. So we begin this story at verse 24 of chapter 4, where after God has called Moses from the midst of the burning bush and gave him instruction to go to Pharaoh and answered all of Moses' objections, Moses and his family have set out to go to Egypt. But it came about at the overnight encampment on the way that the Lord met Moses and sought to put him to death. But the question becomes, if God wants to kill Moses, Who's going to go to Pharaoh? If God wants Moses to go tell Pharaoh to let these people go, why would God be seeking to put Moses to death before he has accomplished the mission? Well, the first thing we need to do is to point out that in the original Hebrew, the text doesn't really identify who God was seeking to put to death. The original text reads this way. Thank you. The original text reads, was I always off? Okay. 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 Uh, the original Hebrew really doesn't identify who God was seeking to put to death. The original Hebrew reads this way. It came about at the overnight encampment on the way that the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. English translators assume that the him that they're talking about is that God met Moses. Moses is the him. So they inserted Moses' name instead of the original him. It should just be the Lord met him. But if it was Moses that God was seeking to kill, then the rest of the story just wouldn't make much sense to me. And so I consulted with a number of commentaries to try to understand why is God trying to put Moses to death. And the consensus is that God wasn't trying to put Moses to death. Instead, God was seeking to put his son, Gershom, to death. So verse 25 says that Zipporah, Moses' wife, took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and threw it at Moses' feet. And she said, you are indeed a groom of blood to me. And so after she did this, the Bible says that God left him, Gershom, alone. If we accept the English commentator's view here, God, God didn't kill Moses because Zipporah circumcised her son, and that just doesn't make sense. Instead, most commentators believe that God sought to kill Gershom. And the reason was because Gershom was not circumcised. Gershom was not circumcised. In Genesis chapter 17, God institutes circumcision as a sign of his covenant with Abraham, with all of Abraham's descendants. He says to Abraham, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. And it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and you. And every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. But as for an uncircumcised male, one who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off 
from his people because he has broken my covenant. That is the covenant of circumcision that God had between Abraham and all of Abraham's descent. So Gershom, Gershom, this little boy is in violation of God's covenant. Little boy is in violation of God's covenant, but it's not the little boy's fault, is it? No, it's actually his parents' fault. And based on the fact that his mother is the only one protesting in this text, I think we can conclude that she was the one resisting having her son circumcised. Zipporah was not a Hebrew, and so she likely didn't see the need for having her child suffer this kind of pain. What is the reason for this? It's unnecessary. But Moses was a Hebrew, and circumcision was a part of their religious obligation. And Gershom is a Hebrew, and he must be circumcised. The text doesn't say this, but I believe there must have been a conversation about this beforehand. Zipporah must have known that Gershom had to be circumcised. Otherwise, she wouldn't have known to cut off the foreskin. She knew what was required, but she casually dismissed God's command. She didn't take God seriously. And she didn't take her husband seriously either. Moses is on a mission from God, and his house is severely out of order. Moses has told his wife about this ritual called circumcision, but she refuses to listen to him. And now God is seeking to kill the boy, to devastate the whole house, because Moses has no influence with his wife. Hmm. Moses has no influence with his wife. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 23 teaches us that the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Moses is the head of Zipporah, even as Christ is the head of the church. So this begs the question. After Moses has explained to her this idea of circumcision and she refuses to have the boy circumcised, what is Moses to do when his wife won't listen to counsel? And I think this incident right here answers that very question. Moses didn't do anything except turn the matter over to God. What is a husband to do when he is giving his wife counsel and she refuses to hear it. Nothing at all. Don't badger and don't demean, don't become abusive, don't become manipulative, just hold your peace. This is a lesson as a married man that took me many, many years to realize. That as the head of my house, I am required to give direction but my wife is responsible for how she responds to that direction. Maybe she doesn't believe I'm on the right track. Maybe she doesn't believe I know enough about the subject to make that decision. Whatever it is, it is not for me to force my will upon her. It is my duty to say what is right, then leave it in her hands as to how she will respond. Moses has told her that Gershom needs to be circumcised. Apparently, she is in conflict about it. She doesn't want to take the counsel, and Moses does nothing about it. And Moses is able to do this with full confidence that if what he is saying is from God, she's going to get the message straight from him. She can do it the easy way or the hard way. It is her decision and her right. Moses has said all he's going to say about the matter. That's some good advice, brothers. If you've given counsel in your house and your wife refuses to hear you, don't keep on badgering. Don't keep on talking. Turn it over to God. If you are right and this is the will of God, believe me, God will 
make his desires known to her. Zipporah chose the hard way. But why? Zipporah chose the hard way because she didn't want to hurt her child. That's why. And I have to say that's a pretty appealing reason. She didn't want to cut her child. Common sense tells all of us that circumcision hurts. And she didn't want to hurt her son. And believe it or not, there are many young married couples who are not in alignment with God's calling because they don't want to hurt their children. Think about it. God calls a husband and a wife to the mission field in some third world country. But they have two small children to worry about. And if they take these two small children to a third world country, the children are going to be picked on and mocked by other children. If they don't know the language, they're going to feel isolated and all alone. We should not underestimate the price that children pay when their parents are called to ministry. There is a price that children pay. It can be a very hard life. And then missionary kids finally come of age and come back to the States after being raised overseas and they feel completely out of place, like they don't fit in. And this sense of isolation causes negative psychological effects, depression and anxiety, all because their mother and their father were called to ministry, pastor's kids, missionary kids. They all tend to have these feelings of resentment and anger issues because of the way they were raised. Mom and dad hurt them for the cause of Christ. Gershom is not called to ministry, but he pays a price for his father's obedience. Brothers and sisters, listen to this. If you are called to ministry, if you are pursuing the will of God, if you are on fire for the Lord, you can believe that if you have children, your children are going to pay a price for your obedience. That's the way it is. That's the way it's always been. Billy Graham, as an old man, when he was asked what would he do differently, Billy said, I would hold less conferences and I would be home more with my children. I would have been home more with my children. He regretted the fact that he had to spend time with his children. But that's Billy Graham, the aged. But when Billy Graham was on fire with the Holy Spirit, Billy was doing what the Holy Spirit was compelling him to do, and his children paid a price for that. Me and my daughter often joke and say, you know, I raised you, I was at home, so I did raise you, but even if all you saw was the back of my chair in my office, I was there, but I was on fire. And I didn't give the time that I could have given. This is why many people with children don't go into ministry because they're afraid that they're going to hurt their children. Their children are going to pay a price. So, so mom, mom cuts off the boy's foreskin. And I would have loved to have been there. See this, she cut off the boy's foreskin and she threw it at Moses' feet. That had to be very interesting. She threw it at Moses' feet. This skin of her son and she says to Moses you are a groom of blood to me neither I nor any scholar seem to know what that cultural significance is of you are a groom of blood but we can conclude one thing for sure Zipporah is mad there is trouble in paradise and coincidentally, or maybe not coincidentally, this trouble has broken out at the worst possible time. And that is the sound and the cadence of all ministry that brings honor to God. That when it is time to do God's will, the enemy will always cause some form of chaos or confusion. I have a gas can in my garage. And this happens almost every Saturday with something, some distraction. I have a gas can in my garage. 
And I went out of my garage, I smelled gas. I said, where are they coming from? Where's it coming from? I look over and my gas can is leaking gas onto the floor. That's strange, that's peculiar. It's a marine tank and the marine tank has a little plug in it. If you don't tighten the plug up, the gas comes out. Well, I went to tighten the plug up and the plug broke and the gas just started shooting out in my garage yesterday, seven o'clock. Almost time for bed to get ready for ministry on Sunday. Always on Saturday, it's always something. Always something on Saturday. The enemy is always busy trying to distract you from doing the work of God. This is a terrible distraction and it is at the wrong moment. Moses doesn't have time for this, but here it is. When God calls you to do his will, when it is time to do the will of God, the enemy will always cause some kind of chaos or confusion in your world. And if he can work through anyone in your house, he most certainly will. And family problems are really the type of problems that can drain a minister of his spirit, distracting him from the work that is at hand. Family problems, marital problems, domestic problems. I don't know where Moses learned this from, but maybe he learned it from his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. But notice this, that Moses doesn't respond at all. I find that very interesting. God is seeking to kill the boy. The woman goes over, cuts off his foreskin, throws the meat down at Moses' feet. You are a groom of blood to me, and Moses doesn't say a word. (laughs) He doesn't even respond. He doesn't even try to engage. He's just standing there with the blood on the floor, like, okay, well, this this is awkward. And we can glean a principle from this lack of engagement on Moses' part. That when you are given an assignment from God, do not allow anyone or anything to get you off course. Keep your focus. Keep your focus. Somebody asked me, Pastor, why do you always come to work like nine, come to church around 9.55 or 10 o'clock? Why do you always get here just when church is ready to start? Because I'm trying to keep my focus. And I always feel like if I get here too early, I'm going to have too many conversations before the service starts, and I'm not going to have my focus. Keep your focus. Moses is staying focused. Moses' son has almost been killed. His wife is angry at him. But Moses has heard the voice of God himself. And as much as he empathizes with his, with his wife's inconvenience, as much as he can relate to his son's pain and the fact that he was almost killed, there is something much greater that Moses is focused on. First things first. That's a hard lesson to learn in ministry. Even when my house is in chaos, First things first, I'll take care of that when I get finished. But right now it's time to serve the Lord. First things first. Moses is so intensely focused that it may look like selfishness. His focus may be interpreted as callousness. He may be accused of being absent and derelict in his duty to care for his family, but Moses is under orders. And like any good soldier, he has to be willing to neglect his own people for a season in order to accomplish the mission of God. Soldiers do it all the time. Deploy and leave their families to go on mission for the government. God requires even more. When I am on mission, nothing and no one, no matter what the problem is, I have to turn away from it for right now. It's time to do the work, and I'll come back to it when I'm finished. This is big. His son was almost killed. His wife is apparently distraught, and Moses doesn't even engage. He's trying to remember what God told him to say. He's on mission. First things first. That is easier said than done, I know for certain, by experience. But for the believer, this is hard to accept, for the believer, for the child of God, 
Not even her children are to take precedence over God's will. That's hard to accept. Not even his children are to take precedence over God's will. It's a very interesting phenomenon in America nowadays, American Christianity, where parents decide what church they're going to attend based on the children's ministry and the youth program, not according to God's calling, not according to God's agenda. The children come first. That sounds good, and in modern culture, that mindset is praiseworthy. But search the scriptures and see how many of God's chosen vessels prioritize their children over God's calling. How many can you find? That's a hard lesson right there. Search the scriptures. How many of God's chosen vessels prioritize their children over the will and call of God? You will, you will not find one example of that. And this ends up making it a very personal and a very uncomfortable subject for some of us. As we look over our daily schedule and we see just how much of our time and energy goes toward our children compared to how much of our focus is toward God. I am not saying that our children should not hold a very high and special place in our hearts and minds. God has given us our children to nurture them and to train them so their physical, emotional, educational, and psychological well-being must be a priority. Not only them, but also your spouse must be a priority, even higher than the children. But no one under your roof, no one outside of your house takes priority over God's calling. And when God calls, everyone connected to me has to understand that I must be about my father's business. The father comes first. So while Moses is busy in his house, picking up the broken dishes, cleaning up the foreskin from the floor, God is carrying out his plan, unfazed by Moses' domestic problem. Look at this. While Zipporah and Moses are at home arguing about the foreskin and circumcision, the Lord said to Aaron, go to meet Moses in the wilderness. So he went and met Moses in the wilderness at the mountain of God and he kissed him. And what does Moses do? Does Moses tell Aaron about the argument he just had with his wife? Does Moses confide in Aaron that his wife seems to hate him? Does he talk to, to, to Aaron about Gershom's close call with death? No, Moses doesn't mention anything about his household. Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him, and all the signs that God had commanded him. Moses is on mission. His house is in disarray, but Moses is on mission. Zipporah, Zipporah is at home still angry. Gershom is at home, still physically uncomfortable, but Moses is on mission. But shouldn't Moses' first mission be to make amends with his wife? Shouldn't Moses' first mission be to secure his own house? Yes, if it were possible. That's what I would advise Moses to do. But if it's not possible, Moses doesn't have time to sit down and wait until his house comes into proper order. And if he does, he will be sitting for the rest of his life and he will never do the will of God. Paul the Apostle says to us that we must work while it is day because nighttime is coming when no one can work. Our mission has a sense of urgency. And if things in your marriage and if things in your house can be resolved, then you should resolve them. But if resolution is going to take a long period of time, then you have to work on it as you can. And not allow God's work to fail while you're trying to fix your family. First things first. Always put God first. Then Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the sons of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. He then performed the signs in the sight of all the people. So the people believed. 
And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed low and they worshiped God. And this is what Moses would have forfeited had he entangled himself in fierce debate with Zipporah. The people believed they bowed low and they worshiped God. And that accomplishes the first portion of his mission. And now that he has this brief intermission, maybe Moses can turn around and try to fix his family. Maybe he can turn around and try to pay more attention to his wife and to his child. As I said in the beginning of this sermon, this is a somewhat perplexing text to comprehend, but the lesson for me is fairly easy to glean. And the lesson is clear, that we should always put God first above everyone that we should always keep our focus on the will of God no matter how distracting our situation might be or become. And if we can do this, God will be glorified through our work and our labor of love. We always talk about giving our all to Jesus, all to Jesus, we surrender. All to Jesus we freely give, but very often when the rubber meets the road, when it comes time to make those big sacrifices, we shy away from doing the will of God because we're concerned about our family. Well, I would go, but my, my son has this problem and my daughter has that problem, so I can't go right now. First things first. That's a hard pill to swallow right there. But that's the price that I paid, that's the price that ministers pay. First things first. And what you find when you go and take care of God's business, when you focus on what God has called and commanded you to do, you know what happens at home? God takes care of your family. Yes, he does. God takes care of your people because you're taking care of his business. I had a prayer, you say to God, my daughter was real small, five or six years old. I said, God, now you know, I didn't have a father growing up. I saw him all the time, but he wasn't really a father to me. I really want to raise my daughter, God, now. So if you're going to put me in ministry, it has to be after my children, after my daughter gets, gets grown. I got to wait. I got to wait to raise my child. A year later, God puts me in ministry like, look, man, first things first. I am more important than your daughter. Huh? Yeah. I'm more important than your daughter. I'm more important than your son. I'm more important than your wife. I'm more important than your husband. First things first. That sacrifice, isn't it? Can you feel that? That sacrifice. <laughs> That's tough. Well, my son is having problems. I got to get out of ministry for a little. I got to take a hiatus for ministry. Who takes a hiatus from? When did God start giving out hiatuses from ministry? When did that happen? No, you don't get a hiatus. If your family is having problems, you deal with that on the side. You continue to do the work and the will of God. Do not allow yourself to be distracted, no matter how difficult your problem at home might be. First things first. And when you put God first, God will take care of a lot of things in your house for you. Billy Graham, look at Franklin Graham today, and is like, wow, he turned out pretty good. He went crazy for a little while, but he turned out okay. God watched out for his children because Billy Graham was out there watching out for other people's children. That's ministry. This idea, this, 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 this ministry of convenience, that I'm only going to serve when it is convenient for me. I'm only going to do things as, as I feel that I have the space and the time. Most of the time, I do not feel like I have the space or the time to serve. I was in a church, I was in a, an, an abusive church. I wasn't being abused, but it wasn't an abusive type of situation going on there. I was just worn out with ministry. And when I got away from that church, I said, you know what, I'm not, I'm not getting involved in ministry ever again in my life. I have enough of this. I don't want anything to do with any of it, the politics and the power grabs and all this craziness. I don't want anything to do with any of it. I'm just going to just serve the Lord quietly over here in my little corner. God said, no, no, no. 
That's not the way this works. First things first. It's not about what you want. It's about what I want from you. And if I am your God, if I am your Lord, then you follow my orders, whether you feel like you have the space or not. And I went to Dr. Winfred Neely's church out there in South Holland, Illinois. I went to Winfred Neely's church and I decided, told my wife, I said, you know, I'm going to go to this church. I like Dr. Neely. I'm going to go to his church and we're going to sit all the way in the back. I had a whole plan. We're going to sit all the way in the back. We're not going to get involved in anything. We're going to go to church because we need to be in church. And I'm not saying anything about ministry or anything. First day, you know what he was preaching on? The book of Jonah. I walked into a sermon on the book of Jonah, and I'm sitting there listening, and God is just speaking to me like, oh, you're in the belly of the whale now, so you don't want to do right. I'm like, no, this can't be for me. It can't be for me. The sermon's over. I get up to leave because I'm feeling kind of convicted. I get up to get out of there as quick as I can. Dr. Neely comes to me and says, hey, brother, do you preach? I, honest to God, do you preach? So what the, no, I don't, I don't preach. I, I think you preach, you got a preacher voice. That's just what he said. I said, sometimes I preach, man. He said, you want to preach next week? <laughs> that is just how, honest to God, that's just how it happened. And that was God telling me, look, man, I don't care about how burdened you are. This is not about your burden. If you do this in my spirit and in my power, you won't use your energy. I don't even need your energy. All I need you to do is be available. I'll do my own work. I just need you to be there. But Lord, I'm stressed out. I don't have time. I don't have space for all of this. It's not about you. I'm not asking you to bring anything to the table and anything you personally bring to the table is only going to contaminate my work anyway. The less of you, the better. Mm-hmm. That's when I learned something when I hear people in church say, I feel burned out. Burned out, well, you're doing your own strength. When you tell me you're burned out, that's because you're operating in your own strength. You don't, you don't get burned out. No. When you do this by the power of the Holy Spirit, there is no burnout. There's no such thing as burnout. Anxiety comes from trying to be too strong for too long on your own. That's what anxiety is about. No, no, no. I'm not burned out. Because when I'm doing the work of God, it is Christ doing the work through me. All I have to do is yield and let him work. That's how you keep from getting burned out and walking away from ministry. Prioritize. Decide today that I am not going to allow myself to be distracted by my bills, by my marital situation, by my children's problems, by my mortgage that's due. I am not going to permit myself to be distracted from doing the will of God, period. First things first. That's what Moses just showed me in that text. To come from this domestic problem. Okay, oh, you finish? You finish? Yeah, the force, you want to get the force scan up? Okay. All right, you okay, Zipporah? You okay? No, I'm not okay. I'm sick and tired of it. Hold on, uh, Aaron's coming. I'll be back. Hey, Aaron. <laughs> God said, yeah, no, no distraction. No distraction. Now, when I get finished with Aaron and doing God's work, I'll come back and talk to Zipporah. And okay, Zipporah, let's sit down and talk about this and debrief. But right now is not the time. Right now is not the moment. I'm on mission. That's dedication, brothers and sisters. That's fire. And that's what God is requiring of each of us. Let's pray. Father God, we worship you with all that we have and with all that we are. We confess today that we have not always put you first. We have not always kept our focus on those things that you require. That our hearts are prone to wander to give up and to resign ourselves, to quit, to walk away frustrated. Father God, we ask today that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit once again and that you would train us 
and how to serve you in spirit and in truth, and not from our own resources. Help us to fix our eyes on you. Help us to live to see you glorified in every situation. You sacrifice everything for us. The opportunity to have a family, you sacrifice that for us. To raise your children, you sacrifice that for us. Help us to serve you, Lord God, gladly, sacrificially, even as you have so sacrificially laid down your life for your friends. In Jesus' name, amen.